Whoa, this chair's uh, sink in quite a bit. Guys, you are in probably the most exciting panel today. So for those of you that are thinking about staying, this is the right choice. And the reason why is because we're at this cusp at the moment of changing how we consume things, how we spend money, how we move money. And the, the loose interpretation of this particular panel is fintech. But in reality, the guests that we have are not just in fintech, they're also in this emerging sector of decentralized economy and blockchain. And so we're going to not only talk about fintech, but we're going to more importantly talk about the most important change in probably the last two decades in terms of how we move money and how we manage money. So joining me on this panel, we have, and they're all going to come at the same time, uh, and then they'll introduce themselves, but we have Justus, Victor, and Catherine. Let's give them a big warm applause. As I mentioned in the introduction, what makes this panel particularly interesting is that although we have this generalized fintech moniker for the, the talk, all of you are in this really cool emerging space of decentralized economy and blockchain. So why don't we just kick off just with you, um, introducing who you are, what your company does, and why it's relevant for the future of the global economy. Yeah, so at Manitha, we're creating a decentralized trust and reputation system in built with payments that is working on the Ethereum blockchain with the power of smart contracts. So everybody understood what that is. <laughs> I'm going to make it a little bit more easier by saying that we're creating a reputation system which essentially helps the buyers feel safe when buying and for the sellers to build their reputation online. And this is where blockchain comes in. Two main aspects. That the reputation that the sellers build is immutable and it's not, it cannot be manufactured by Manitha. So every other uh, reputation platform that is not using blockchain technology essentially can, um, can manufacture those, those ratings, and that has been documented. The other uh, value proposition that blockchain brings is the transferability. So the illusion that you own your reputation online is false you don't own the reputation. The marketplaces own your reputation. And we want to empower the sellers and the buyers move that reputation through other platforms. And from an organizational standpoint, we're uh, a company of 25 employees. We're uh, based in Switzerland. Our business operations, our um, software development is in Lithuania. Uh, and we have raised a successful ICO on the 31st of March. Uh, uh, of 95,000 ethers, which is at this moment somewhere around $60 million. And we did our maximum cap in 18 minutes. So just to, you help me understand what you do a little bit better by um, identifying that you're not a marketplace, that you piggyback off of marketplaces. Do you want to just share which ones you gave as an example? Yeah, we want to start with classified ad marketplaces because the trust problem there is an open wound. Uh, it's just you don't know who's behind the sale. The sales are not, the purchases are not registered. They're not um, formalized, and we want to change that. Cool. Victor. Hi, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Airfox. And uh, Airfox wants to help bring financial inclusion to emerging markets and most importantly to the unbanked and underbanked around the world. So there are about 2 billion people around the world that are unbanked and another 2 billion that are underbanked. And most of these people, what that means is that they don't have access to financial services that we take for granted. So take a loan, for example. Most of these users that want a loan within this demographic usually can get a loan, which means that they can get capital to move up the socioeconomic ladder. Or if they do get a loan, they're exposed to predatory lending rates that can range between 100% to 400% APRs. And the reason why traditional banks don't serve the, this population very well is, one, the the, they don't know how to risk assess these users. So most of these users are informal and cash-based economies. And the way that archaic credit models work today is that they take between 10 to 20 static data points that you may be familiar with your credit card bills, right? Employment history and so on and so forth. However, these, these users um, are cash-based, so they don't know how to assess that. And the second problem is traditional institutions, financial institutions, 
have a very high cost of capital to serve this audience. So Airfox solves this. The way we solve this is through three pillars of our technology, mobile, data science, and blockchain. So through mobile, users download our free Android app, which serves as a digital bank using their smartphone. So now a poor, unbanked user can download our app and do all the things that they can do with the bank. They can do peer-to-peer -peer transfer, they can pay their bills, and so on and so forth. The second is um, through the th through the data points that we create from the smartphone, from the transactional history of our app, and the behavioral history, we collect over a thousand data points to credit assess the reliability of this user. And lastly, through the blockchain, we can move capital a lot more efficiently and tap into a peer-to-peer -peer global pool of lenders that allows us to microfinance these users at a fraction of a cost that a bank could. So through these three types of technology, we can actually offer a much more efficient um, capital service to these unbanked and underbanked users. Airfox is uh, the first venture-backed company in the East Coast to do an ICO. We raised $16 million today, and we're based in Boston. And we're live in Brazil right now as our first market. Cool. And the way that you succinctly described it to me was M-Pesa meets Funding Circle. Yeah, M-Pesa meets Funding Circle or Lending Club on the blockchain. Yes. Excellent. All right, Catherine. Uh, yes, I'm Chief Operations Officer for Zeus Exchange, and what we basically do, we're a hybrid trading platform that connects traditional exchanges like New York Stock Exchange, for example, with crypto markets. What it means is actually that you can trade both traditional assets and crypto assets and withdraw both fiat and uh, cryptocurrency. So basically, on a really high level, we allow you to buy IBM shares for Bitcoin. Excellent. So we're going to explore each one of these, but before we do that, just a quick intro about myself in case you're wondering who I am. Um, my name is Carlos, as you know. I run an early stage seed fund based in London called SeedCamp. We've made over 270 investments, some in the blockchain space, a lot in the fintech space. You might know Revolut, uh, which recently raised a large round and is our third unicorn. So based on what each of you uh, shared, um, we're basically starting to tap early into the sort of power of decentralized infrastructure and rethinking some of these models. To, to your point, Victor, looking at models that worked in the past like M-Pesa and then adding an element of blockchain that allows it to basically approach a whole bunch of different people with a new service like loans. So with that in mind, and considering this is the growth summit, let's explore some of the challenges of scaling that. So firstly, just as you were mentioning that you raised 37 million, how do you manage that? How do you as a founder who's raised that amount of money, not become a fund manager rather than actually using that money? And how do you keep that active? That's, uh, that's of course, very compelling. And that's what a lot of ICOs do. Uh, but we have not raised our money with the promise of, you know, getting that capital bigger through other verticals. Our main goal is to create what we have set out to create. And that starts with our product. And this is where we really focus on is building the product and not, you know, looking at other ways of gaining capital. Um, and I've heard so many stories of ICOs raising Ether, then putting that Ether back into other ICOs. And essentially maybe through a kind of legal framework that's not illegal of what they're doing, but that definitely kind of draws uh, away from the focus that you have. And our main focus is not, you know, to... Um, get 50% of our capital uh, more uh, with, with investing. Uh, for us, is, is to be beyond that, way beyond that, is to become a, a unicorn. Hmm. But how do you manage to keep a team incentivized? So for example, each of you have different uh, mechanisms by which you do this, but in, this, in the theme of the Growth Summit, how do you keep a team incentivized when now the key driver for growth, uh, value creation, is this token versus a traditional ESOP? Yeah, so for us, a little bit different because we did a venture round before. So unlike many ICOs, we have a board that, ha that implies some type of governance. And as a U.S. token, that's, uh, we're not giving out tokens to employees in this sense. So I think it's, it's, um, it's a middle ground where like, I think the future of blockchain is not fully decentralized. I think there needs to be either through a board or through token governance a way for uh, people that are accountable for the ICO to manage that capital in a way that's responsible. And right now, I don't think we've seen that. Um, the way we do it, at least Airfox, being a venture-backed company that did an ICO, is to have the corporate uh, board that manages that capital, just like a VC uh, yeah. raise would. So it's interesting, because you're basically alluding to the fact that we're slowly starting to borrow stuff from the old e economy and starting to map that onto 
new economy type structures. And one of the things that is, is tricky, and maybe you can help me with this, Catherine, is, is this idea of the liquidity that crypto and tokens offer, mapping it to the risks and ups and downs that an early stage venture has. You know, um, you specifically may not necessarily have this problem, but there are some other companies out there where the, the liquidity available through the token puts a lot of pressure on the company to, to do things maybe that are not even in the, in the shareholder's interests because you're trying to effectively replicate a public market dynamic, but at the same time trying to deal with all the early stage growth issues. How, how do you think that that's going to evolve and how are you guys managing it over at Zeus Exchange? So we're actually preparing for our ICO outside the US. We're based in Singapore. Uh, we do have options for tokens for teams as incentive and actually what we're doing is it's more preferred B shares that will be transferred into tokens so they actually have a choice. Um, and I think right now we're still in the phase when everything is still forming, right? And uh, in general, companies raising ICOs, they are under higher pressure just because there's so many scams, right? Happening out there, you don't know what's actually going to happen. And I think, uh, as guys mentioned, it's like, yes, it's up to you and up to us right now to create that new, new era for finance, right? And fintech and financing companies. And obviously, we're going to you know, see what others are doing and what's happening and what's happening in venture capital. We're going to take some of that in there. And I think that the creation of the market, it's actually growing, it's booming. And um, we're, for example, we're focusing on locations that are already really, like Asia, right? It's huge. And um, yeah, I think like it's forming itself. And I think it's hard for us to do right now anything that is going to boost it because it's still forming. Mm. Did you guys want to comment on that at all? Yeah, I want to touch on like the instant, uh, incentivization for, for the employees. And this has been a game changer for us when in, there is a token. Uh, employees are really excited about the opportunity of being, you know, besting the tokens and being able to see their monetary value. And for us as a company, it's also important because we do have a lot of tokens. And the higher the, the value uh, there is, you know, the better for us it is and better for them. Um, and the liquidity, it's instant. You know, they can go on Binance and, and, and liquidate the tokens that they receive. Whereas in option there, uh, options, there has always been this thing where, you know, you wait for 10 years, you wait for... Well, I let me push on that just as because it sounds great on, on the surface, but on the negative, you're also incentivizing a lot more weird behavior because you have that early liquidity. So how, how is the entirely decentralized economy um, starting to sort of ad adhere to old common practices in order to prevent these kinds of things just because the token enables you to do these nefarious things? How, how are you regulating that? Yeah, so there are safety mechanisms as, you know, vesting periods and things like that. Um, as mentioned, you know, this, this is... Um, it also be, uh, begins with the culture, what has been set out. These are, these are kind of manual things, manual mechanisms, how you can prevent this kind of idea of employee doing everything that the token price would be you know, higher rather than building on the long-term vision. Mm. There's, think, also, oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> There's also right now um, like companies, and we're looking into it, actually creating a block. So you're issuing the option of tokens, but they are not able to trade it, for example. Or if it's a dividend token, they're not going to get dividends for a specific period of time, and uh, only the investors will actually get all of the benefit from day one. Mm. So that is also something that is happening yeah. right now. I think what I would say is like the future is uh, smart contract governance into these tokens. So a lot of the stuff from the old model that like it would be in your bylaws that would tell you like preferred shares have these types of rights should be implemented into the token to make sure that incentives are aligned. Because right now, you know, you're if you buy an, an ICO, um, you don't have any accountability except that you've got to trust the founders that they're going to do the right thing. And I don't think that model scales. Yeah. So you just brought up a really good point, which is incentives. And I'm going to pick on you, Justice, on this because it's an easier one, but maybe both of you can pitch in. So the risk any early stage company has is that whatever it's peddling, it gets wrong in the customer's eyes. And by doing so, effectively the company just doesn't take off. Now, with your uh, trust network, you almost need to guarantee that the trustworthy relationships of both sides, buyer and seller, go well so that there's a good network effect, which then means everyone's happy. But in effect, it means that you're also playing this game of being a little bit of a centralized agent to make sure that things go the way they are, which then runs the risk that we're all going to go back to the power of the centralized network rather than having 
of truly decentralized? Is that even possible? It, truly decentralization, a true decentralization is in a lot of the applications is very utopian. Uh, I think that's possible, you know, with Bitcoin has really kind of uh, solved that. But when it comes to, you know, many other applications, we're still in this embryonic stage for the blockchain technology where it's really hard to reach that. And there needs to be some, not, I wouldn't call it a centralized authority. I, I would call that an onboarding kind of uh, project uh, or, or, or a company, which Manitha is. Mm. Victor, how about you? How I mean, I, I concur with that. I think that um, communism sounds great in theory, but you know, it doesn't it doesn't work. So, like decentralization is the same thing. Unless you're a true commodity token, I think there has to be a centralized, a leader or a founder or a team that is driving that project forward. I mean, just take take Ethereum for example. Um, you know, people criticize, and there's the fork, but. Vitalik is pushing that forward. As, as, as decentralized as it is, they have a very clear roadmap. And I think for the successful companies, there has to be some type of set centralized agent that is pushing the vision forward. Um, so I, I don't know if I believe in like true decentralization of everything. Catherine, you said you were going to go for an ICO soon, right? Yes. So um, what are the four things that you've dealt with at the moment in preps for an ICO that you would give as advice to anybody who's thinking about that? And then maybe you can add to anything that, that you wanted to add to this afterwards. Yeah, well, I'll take the feedback too. <laughs> um, so first of all was actually figuring out the, is always the amount of raise, right? And how we want to structure it. Because right now we see so much things happening, right? We have security tokens, we have uh, tokens like what will be the dividend, how it's going to be distributed, what's happening, the token allocation. And then one of the biggest questions that actually came up with us is the focus, the location, under which jurisdiction are we going to do the raise, right? Where are we going to register it? Um, given that, you know, are we registered in Singapore? Do we even want to approach the US? Um, so that was one of the biggest things for us of like to decide because it also depends on the amount of money you'll end up spending um, on the ICO and what we're referring to it is like more like a digital IPO versus ICO mm -hmm. right now. Um, yeah, and um, but know? the rest is just, you know, the, the rest is pretty standard in terms of fundraising for a startup. It's document, documents, financial modeling, all of that stuff is quite standard for mm -hmm. us. You know where I'm going to go with this one in a second, Victor, but maybe you want to add to that? Yeah, sure. I, I definitely agree that, you know, first, you know, legal is so important uh, for you to set up everything correctly because you can do a successful ICO, but it doesn't matter if afterwards you cannot liquidate that money and cannot run a, a, a proper company. But all in all, I would say that, you know, startups is a show business and ICOs is show business on steroids. Uh, and you and you will see, you know, in terms of legal and in, in terms of this kind of substance behind the company, you will see the IPO bar and the ICO bar kind of merging. Mm. All right. So let's wrap up with Victor. You chose to do a traditional investment round, and then also the issuance of, of, of the, the product and token. Walk us through the logic behind that, being that your two colleagues next to each other have chosen the, the strict ICO route. Well, I mean, we did, we've been around for three years now, so the venture round was our seed round, and we chose the token sale route as our, I guess, Series A, you could say. Um, and the reason why we chose that is we found a tremendous value on creating a network that we would get people to contribute to crowdfund this idea that would eventually become lenders in the platform. And obviously, the non-dilutive capital is another, another interesting aspect of that. <laughs> How many are raising ICOs in the audience? All right, well, that's actually lower than I expected. So let's give a, a big round of applause for our panelists, and uh, thanks for joining, guys.